Shooter, stand by. Yep. Hey everybody, what's going on? Thanks for swinging by, I sure do appreciate it. If this is your first time with the channel, my name is Mark. Oh, hi Mark. Welcome to Fit and Fire. Let's get into this video. This time we're going to uh, change directions just a little bit. Over the last couple of years, I've gotten really deep and heavy into AKs. It is one of my favorite platforms to shoot for a number of different reasons. And we'll talk about that in a future video. But I have, over the last, I would say six to eight months, kind of pulled together a couple of different AR setups. And I wanted to talk about some of those types of setups, why you might consider one versus the other and how they kind of blur the line between uh, the functionalities between say a general purpose rifle versus a special purpose rifle versus an infantry automatic rifle. So GPR versus SPR versus IAR and uh, talk about how you could feasibly choose any one of them and they could work for all the different scenarios. That's really going to challenge a lot of people's mental grasp because they're kind of in the camp of, I need an SPR to do this and I need a GPR to do this and I need an IAR to do this. When in fact, you probably could find something in the middle to do all three. But this time we're gonna be looking at an SPR, special purpose rifle here. This is the one that I've set up over the last, I would say probably, oh, probably eight months. And um, I didn't like drop a whole metric ton of money into this. Some of the stuff I already had and I just kind of piecemealed it together, but we will talk about the base rifle setup We'll talk about the optic and the red dot that I have here and why I set it up this particular way, why I chose the optic. We'll talk about the accuracy of this and then we will talk about how I've been able to use it and whether or not this could be used for home defense, land defense, um, urban environment type stuff or whatever the case may be. So with that being said, my question to you guys is what is your AR setup? Do you have just a general purpose rifle with like a red dot on it? Do you do the red dot magnified uh, setup? Do you go SPR with a MPVO? Or do you have something in between? Let me know down in the comment section down below. In addition to that, if this is your first time with the channel, I would greatly appreciate you guys considering subscribing to the channel. Any type of interaction, thumbs up, thumbs down, comments, whatever the case may be, also really helps the algorithm as well for my message to get out and uh, for me to curate more content for you guys. So with all of that being said, let's talk about exactly what's going on with this particular setup. Now, the upper receiver and the lower receiver are different and I did that for my own reasons. Um, could I have gone out and bought this the, just from the same manufacturer, upper and lower? Yeah, I could, but I didn't not for any other reason than my own silly mind. But with that being said, the upper receiver is going to be a Daniel Defense Mark 12. And I chose the Mark 12 from Daniel Defense, even though I'm not a huge fan of Daniel Defense, I did choose it because I do recognize and understand the fact that the Mark 12 setup is quite possibly one of the best off the shelf options for quality, uh, reliability, accuracy, and availability. I mean, you put all of those together and I think that the Daniel Defense Mark 12 uppers are kind of the way to go. Not to say that you couldn't build your own. You definitely could. You could get, you know, a really high quality barrel with a real good, you know, upper receiver and pull that together with the handguard that you want. I get all of that. But off the shelf, ready to go, I think the Mark 12s are the way to go. The lower receiver is going to be a Colt AR-15A4. And I went with that because I do like the A2 style setup. Uh, the length of pull is 
just perfect for me. It's what I grew up with when I joined the Army in 2000. The uh, length of pull is perfect for me. I don't need a, you know, a cheek riser or anything like it. I, I can get in behind it in my eyes exactly where I would need it to be each and every single time. It's very repeatable for me and familiar. So that's why I went with the Daniel Defense Upper with the Colt Lower. I chose Colt because they've been around for a long time and I feel that um, the preponderance of the QAQC for their materials is quite possibly one of the better ones out there. Uh, you know when you hear someone say Colt, you're more than likely going to get a good product. So there is that. The accessories that I have on here is a BNT Atlas bipod. It's boringly reliable, so nothing really to comment there. Uh, I had this in, I've had this for years now and just decided to go ahead and throw that on there. The scope on here is a medium power variable optic. So two to 12 by 44, and it is the Swamp Fox Kentucky long. I went with this optic because um, people like Brass Facts have done countless videos on a number of different scopes and for the MPVO uh, on a budget I think that this is one of the better offerings. He did like it. I don't I don't want to say that he recommended it over others but he did say that he did like this uh, for everything that it comes with. Coming in at $399, uh, it's, it's got a throw lever that is included, it has locking turrets, parallax adjustments, uh, it has a illuminated reticle if that's something that you like, and it's been rock solid. It does have the mill Christmas tree style reticle that allows me to do uh, quick holdovers and I don't have to dial. So I can go ahead and zero this optic, lock in the turrets, and be done with it. And more than likely from zero to 600 yards, I'm not going to need to do anything with the, uh, with the turret. So that is something I really did like. Should you spend as much money on your glass as your rifle? Um, if you need something that is going to be like half MOA or better, then I would say yes. For me, I need it to be 1.5 MOA or better because I know that, um, I'm only probably going to be shooting out to maybe 450 yards, uh, so I don't necessarily need the most accurate gas gun out there. So spending $399 on a optic like this is going to be right where I need it to be. So there is that. 45 degree angle mount here for my Holosun 507C, and... Um, that's worked out very, very well. The only things that I've done really to change this rifle is I've changed out the mil spec charging handle for a Radian Raptor. I really like the enhanced style uh, charging handles to get around a large optic like this. Uh, I have put a new pistol grip on this because it has a nice shallow angle, something I really do like. It is the EPG. 16 v2 from mission first tactical so uh, very comfortable really do like it and then finally the trigger i did put a flat face trigger in from ballistic engineering it's a new trigger company on the market i've had it for about six months been doing some testing with it and have really really liked it it's going to be very similar to the cassette style drop-in triggers from like tibney or cmc and uh, this one has the ability for you to dial in the trigger weight that you want from four and a half pounds down to two and a half pounds. And to be frank and honest with you, you can actually go a little bit lighter than that. But uh, <laughs> um, I put it at two and a half pounds because that gives me just enough resistance to ensure that I'm doing exactly what I want to do when I pull that trigger but still light enough for me to get really quick um, you know, double taps on you know, short range targets. So there is pretty much the quick rundown of everything that I've done on this. Uh, obviously did a rattle can job on this. Uh, it was the second rifle I've ever done it on and um, it's not anything special. It just is what it is. <laughs> so let's talk about accuracy on this, this particular rifle. 
And that is going to be an area that is probably going to be very contentious for a lot of people because SPRs should be more accurate than a standard fighting rifle. I do understand that. The military says that a fighting rifle being submitted for trials should be four MOA or better at 100 yards. And if you buy that, fine. But for me personally, a just regular old rifle off the shelf should at least be two and a half MOA or better. Impact. Something that is meant for accuracy at longer distances, Impact. talking four to 600 yards, I want it to be at minimum 1.5 MOA or better. Now, I also am a realist and I know that I am not an expert marksman. Um, I am an average shooter, if not a little bit above average, but at the end of the day, I want my rifles to be especially my accurate ones, be 1.5 MOA or better. So let's get into the accuracy from this. And I did it in such a way that may not be everybody's favorite way of doing things. Uh, essentially what I did to try to eliminate me as much as possible is I devised an 80% solution for the accuracy of this rifle. What does that mean? That means that for anyone shooting this rifle, 80% of the time, this is the accuracy that you should expect from this rifle. And how did I do that? Well, I put a five round group on target and took away one of the flyers, utilizing the bipod and sandbag to stabilize the rifle. So take that for what you will. If it's the way you like it, great. If not, I understand that as well. But at the end of the day, this is how I did it. So let's dive into it. The six cartridges that I tried uh, for accuracy is going to be fairly standard for what you would find on any shelf of almost any um, sporting goods store or online. And that's going to be Winchester M193, Winchester M855, also used Hornady Black 62 grain FMJ 223, Hornady Black 75 grain Boattail Hollow Point 223, and then went back to 5.56 on some of the heavier cartridges, utilizing the Frontier 5.56 75 grain boat tail hollow point, which is that Hornady match bullet. And then finally, AAC 77 grain 5.56 OTMs. So those are the six cartridges that I tried and here are the um, groups that I got from it. The first one, M193, uh, was actually really surprised. I did have a wild flyer that wasn't even in the picture, but uh, the accurate four round group, uh, obviously a little high because it's not zero to this, but we did get a 0.726 MOA grouping out of that, which really blew my mind with that 55 grain bullet. Moving on from there, we went to the Winchester M855, and I was expecting the 62 grain bullets to do a little bit better, or at least consistent with the M193s, but no, this one ended up at 1.649 MOA, uh, again, eliminating that one flyer. Really surprised that uh, it wasn't better, but you'll see here the consistency with the 62 grain bullet utilizing the Hornady Black 62 grain FMJ. That's a 223 uh, loading and that ended up being 1.648 MOA as well. So uh, very consistent with that 62 grain bullet. Moving on to the Hornady Black 75 grain boat tail hollow point 223 and we got a sub MOA group at 0.945 MOA which uh, I ended up using in the two gun competition we'll talk about here in just a second. From there, the Frontier 75 grain Boattail Hollow Point Hornady Match Bullet uh, got a 0.945 MOA. So again, consistent from Hornady Black to Frontier. But then moving on to AAC 77 grain OTMs, we see that I got a 1.417 MOA group. Could have been a little bit better if that one flyer had been closer to the other group. If I just took the three, it probably would have been MOA or better. But um, again, this is an 80% solution. So 80% of the time, this is what you should expect in my rationale. 
Is that the right way to do it? I don't know. Let me know down in the comment section how you would do it, and we can have a discussion about that. There you have the accuracy from this particular rifle. I'm sure there's a lot of you out there that could probably shoot this better than me, and I'm not going to pretend that uh, that's not true. But what I will say is shooting this in a practical sense uh, proved to be uh, a bit surprising as well because this ended up performing very, very well at my local two-gun match. I decided to put it through that match just to see kind of how I could fare in very close shooting situations and very far shooting situations. Now, I get it. When I say very far, at this match, the furthest that we shot was 307 yards. I understand a lot of people can shoot that with a red dot and shoot that accuracy accurately with a red dot. Well, we'll touch on that here in just a second. So hold on one. <laughs> hold your angry typing for just one second. There were 28 shooters out there, and uh, I'll share with you guys how I placed at the uh, end of this segment. But this did very, very well. I'm only going to talk about three of the five because these three kind of encapsulates, uh, encapsulates everything that we did through the entire day. So let's start off with the first one, and that's going to be our quote-unquote shoot house. Uh, a lot of fun to shoot, regardless if you're using something like this or, you know, something as small as like a crink or, you know, whatever. It, it's a lot of fun to shoot, and uh, to have something like that available to us here locally is really, really cool. But Essentially, it's run and gun. We all know that uh, we all know where the targets are, uh, so it's not like we're clearing the house like the military would. But what it does do is show how you can employ something like this, this particular setup, in a quote unquote CQB kind of scenario where you're having to move through doors, around hallways, in corridors, and so on and so forth. And this performed very, very well. Now, is this better than a carbine or a AR pistol? Absolutely not. This banged around the doorways and hallways and stuff like that. I had to, you know, move this to port to get around certain doors or bring it down. I had to, in some cases, shoot from uh, the, shoot from with the buttstock up over my shoulder uh, to get as close as I was in some of those situations. So yeah, uh, probably not the, best option sure, but one that i wanted to I prove clear. that you could run this very fast in those tight you know those yeah. tight areas right. so there is that did very well uh one of the better uh faster Probably runs than, uh, of the pistol. entire group <laughs> so the next nice. stage immediately following that was the quote-unquote north meadow or our long range again i get it it's only 307 yards but that 307 yard target was an eight inch gong, right? So you had to dial in your accuracy uh, very, very tight uh, to get through that stage as quickly as possible. Naturally, you start off with some pistol targets and you know that wasn't that big of a deal, but then what I ended up doing was setting this optic at 10 power. We start off with one target at uh, about 80 yards. There's a target right after it just to the right at about 120 yards. Kind of hard to see down in that grass. And I know you guys probably can't see it through the GoPro footage. But moving on from there, we had one at 200 yards, another one at 220, and then the 307 yard target. Now, one of the things that I ended up doing was I used that Hornady Black 75 grain boat tail hollow point as the ammunition of choice for that particular stage. And I already knew that it was dialed in with this optic on this rifle. So I just input the information from the box into a ballistic calculator and knew that my holdovers were going to be 0.47, about 0.47 mils at 200 yards and approximately 1.17 mils at 300 yards. So I knew that if I could get in close, I should probably be able to uh, bracket those rounds into a, an accurate shot. And I ended up going one for one on, on all five targets. So that was super cool. I think I had the second fastest 
time on that stage only because uh, my pistol really brought me down on the last three targets. Um, I wasn't as accurate as I should have been. So, all right, so moving on to the next stage and the last stage that we'll talk about is one that we had to start inside a minivan in the middle seats. And the reason why I wanna talk about this is because you have to have your rifle on you when you start nope. and you have Stand to by. draw your pistol with your rifle slung at your side or in your lap or whatever the case may be. So I just put it in my lap, drew my pistol, engaged all the pistol targets. Once you get done engaging all those pistol targets, then you um, clear your pistol and drop it into the drop box, pick up your rifle and engage targets on the move as you go up to the last shooting position up the ramp. Targets from there are approximately 80 to 125 yards. Again, quote unquote, unknown distances. I just set this at the six powered setting and just kind of put the reticle right on target and pulled triggers. Again, going one for one with the exception of my very last target, which was um, a second round impact and the last four targets were um, eight inch or smaller gongs. So uh, I think I did per pretty well on that one. Again, having one of the fastest times in the entire um, match. So I think I was top four fastest times of the day on that particular stage. So with all of that being said, I ended up placing fifth using this rifle at a two gun match. Now, I get it, my two gun match is not one of these major matches where you're going to have tons of people um, that are sponsored shooters and stuff like that. But what I will say is, we have a lot of really good shooters in my group um, and locally here. And to be able to pit myself against some of these really good shooters um, and do so with something that should not do very well in a two-gun match. I was very proud of myself. I did end up beating the match director. Uh, he's a really good shooter. He just did, he just had an off day, I think, and uh, ended up beating him by seven one-hundredths of a second. So that was pretty cool. But at the end of the day, uh, I just wanted to show that to prove that this particular setup could be used and kind of gray the line between what an SBR can do. You could actually use this as a fighting rifle, realistically. I mean, an SBR is pretty much used in a infantry squad or, or fire team uh, to put effective rounds on target, not only close, but also up to 600 yards away. So just wanted to kind of talk about that for a little bit and, you know, just get people out of the thinking that this particular setup can only be used for long range shooting when it comes to ARs. And, and that's just a false equivalent, I guess. You can really, really use this to mess some stuff up. So with that being said, let me know what you guys think of this particular setup. Sound off in the comment section down below. I would love to hear what you guys have to say about that. Again, uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of different types of setups and why you might want to use one opposed to the other and how they kind of blur that line. And you'll see how all of this kind of morphs as we get into these videos throughout the summer. So with that being said, I really do appreciate you guys swinging by. Make sure you guys are checking out the podcast. I'll leave a link in the pinned comment and in the description below so you guys can check that out. If you haven't subscribed, I'd appreciate that as well. But we're going to go ahead and get out of here. As always, freedom through strength. Here comes a high five. Catch you guys later. Bye, y'all.